And now I'll get to the part you all really came for, and that's here in our speaker tonight, Mr. Martin Brown. Martin has had quite a colorful co career. He has served in the Army. He's been a Dallas policeman. And for the last 35 years or so, he's operated a private detective agency specializing in corporate investigations for some of the largest companies in America. And then sometimes, somehow he has also found the time to write an excellent book about the great Glen Rose moonshine raid and is here tonight to delve into that story for us. So let's give a big Hood County welcome to Mr. Martin Lowe. shared by everyone in the country. More and more churches and civic organizations throughout the U.S. in the 19th century were speaking out against the use of intoxicating spirits. Organizations such as the Women's Christian Temperance Union and the Annie Saloon League blamed the demon rum for creating a generation of drunkards as they characterized it. They believed that wives and children were deprived of money that was going to the local saloons, <clears throat> that otherwise able-bodied workers were wasting away in drunken stupors. Well, their cause was picked up by the progressive movement that was sweeping across the U.S. in the late 1800s. Now, progressives believed that government could be used as a tool to regulate and change the social behavior of its citizens or social evolution of its citizens. The consumption of alcohol and its effects on the fabric of a prosperous and orderly society was certainly within the purview of government, many progressives believed. One 19th century writer said, the sphere of individual liberty must be shrunken. Indeed, if it cannot enclose all that lies within a man's skin. <clears throat> many states had already passed legislation that restricted the availability of alcoholic beverages by the turn of the 20th century. Groups like the Annie Saloon League, however, believed that the only way to eliminate the scourge of alcohol was to pass a national law that would end it once and for all. Well, of course, not everybody agreed. And soon the country was divided among two groups who came to be called the wets and the dries. Politicians began to take sides. Some even tried to hopscotch through the issue, attempting to appease constituents on both sides. <clears throat> now, this was perfectly, perfectly illustrated in a speech by a Mississippi legislator named Noah Swift, who went by the nickname of Soggy. Soggy Swift. <laughs> Must be a Mississippi thing. When asked by constituents how he stood on the question of whiskey, Soggy said, if when you say whiskey, you mean the devil's brew, the poison scourge, the bloody monster that defiles innocence, dethrones reason, destroys a home, creates misery and poverty, yea, literally takes the bread from the mouths of little children, you mean that evil drink that topples the Christian man and woman from the pinnacle of righteous, gracious living into the bottomless pit of degradation and despair and shame and helplessness and hopelessness, then certainly I'm against it. But if when you say whiskey, you mean the oil of conversation, the philosophic wine, the ale that is consumed when good fellows get together, that puts a song in their hearts and laughter on their lips and a warm glow of contentment in their eyes. If you mean that stimulating drink that puts a spring in the old gentleman's step on a frosty, crispy morning, if you mean the drink that enables a man to magnify his joy and his happiness and to forget for a little while life's 
great tragedies and heartaches and sorrows. If you mean that drink, the sale of which pours into our treasury untold millions of dollars which are used to provide tender care for our little crippled children, our blind, our deaf, our pitiful, aged, and infirm, to build highways and hospitals and schools, well then certainly I'm for it. <laughs> that is my stand. I will not retreat from it. And I will not compromise. <laughs> There's an expression that's been used so much that it's kind of become a cliche, so I hate to use it, but it so captures the conditions by which the national prohibition of alcohol was coming together. It was a perfect storm. The progressive movement had put a president in the White House, Woodrow Wilson. Any drink organizations, such as the Anti Saloon League, were gaining a greater hold on national political leaders. The women, who had largely backed the anti drink movement, were demanding the right to vote, and it appeared they were about to get their wish. That meant that a large voting block was about to open up, and male legislators knew that being on the wrong side of that vote would spell disaster for them. Also, during the build-up to World War I, dry forces characterized rich beer barons like Pats and Slits as enemies of the state and secret supporters of the German Kaiser. And returning soldiers, boys who had lost their innocence in war-torn cities in Europe, were coming home as men whose newly acquired habits needed to be controlled. Now all this culminated into the passing of a resolution by Congress <clears throat> to amend the U.S. Constitution with language making it illegal to manufacture, transport, or sell any intoxicating beverages within the United States. The resolution was then sent to the 48 states to ratify. In January of 1919, back 100 years ago this year, Nebraska became the 36th state to ratify the amendment, thus giving a two-thirds majority of the states which was required to amend the U.S. Constitution. In short order, the Volstead Act was passed in November of 1919, which defined the terms and enforcement of the 18th Amendment. Although it bore the name of House Judiciary Chairman Andrew Volstead, it was largely written and introduced by Wayne Wheeler, who was the National Director of the Andy Saloon League. Now, Texas had been flirting with prohibition since its founding. Under the Republic of Texas, a local option law allowed precincts, cities, and counties to decide for themselves whether liquor could be sold. But in 1845, a law was passed that outlawed saloons completely in the state. It was, however, flagrantly violated, and in 1856, the law was repealed. Well, that didn't stop the Texas dry forces. The Texas Constitution in 1876 allowed again for local option and several counties went totally dry. A number of referendums to take the state into total prohibition were defeated by voters over the next 30 years. This was despite strong lobbying of lawmakers by organizations like the Anderson League. Now that changed in March of 1918 when Texas became the eighth state to ratify the 18th Amendment. National prohibition came to Texas a year later. In October of 1919, Texas passed the Dean Act, its own version of the Volstead Act. Now, whereas the Volstead Act called for a fine of less than $1,000 and a year in jail for violating its provisions, the Dean Act called for five years imprisonment for the first offense. Things are always bigger in Texas. Texas Prohibition's most ardent supporter, progressive Democrat Pat Neff, was elected governor the next year. Neff, a former McLennan County lawyer and prosecutor, was a strict Baptist who was instrumental in keeping the saloons out of Waco. He decided to forego the customary inaugural ball when he was elected since he and his wife didn't believe in dancing. His opponent in the 1920 election said of Neff, he is entirely too good for the soul soiling business of politics because he has never used either whiskey or tobacco, did not know one card from the other, and had never gone fishing. <laughs> well, it's certainly no surprise that Texas, a state that had voted down any drink laws over the past 30 years, 
was sharply divided over the 18th Amendment. In many places, thirsty Texans had little trouble finding a good drink of whiskey, while the local officials turned a blind eye. This was certainly included places with large German and Hispanic populations, places where alcoholic beverages were deeply ingrained in their cultures. And Neff wasn't going to put up with it. He told the leader of the Texas branch of the Andy Saloon League that he intended to prod up any officials who were negligent in their duties. Neff had planned to rely on the famed and storied Texas Rangers to accomplish the task, saying, 1,000 Rangers could be used to suppress lawlessness and bring to justice those local officials who willfully and corruptly refused to enforce state law. And never mind the fact that the state legislature had restricted the Texas Rangers to 20 Rangers for each of the four companies in the state, which made less than 100, but Neff uh, made good use of what he had. Now, while these weighty and urgent decisions were being made in the state's highest offices, other factors were dictating the way things really were out in the hinterlands. Texas farmers had grown used to good and steady income that cotton brought to them. Demand was high during the Great War. And more and more, they relied on its production. As the war ended, the demand began to sag made more so by the opening of farm production now that the hostilities had ceased. But the final blow came with the arrival of a little bug with a long snout that began to lay waste to the Texas cotton crops, the Texas boll weevil, a visitor from Mexico that had been plaguing that country for about 2,000 years. Hit particularly hard by the cotton crisis was Somerville County. <laughs> What crops the Rocky Hills would allow was precious to the local growers, most being tenant farmers who worked the land and shared the production with the owners. Watching the price of cotton steadily dropping and what crops they had being destroyed by a wanton little bug, farmers were getting desperate to feed and clothe their families. What little welfare there was back then mostly came from churches and neighbors and relatives. It was truly a matter of survival for those people. Now what the Rocky Hills of Somerville County did offer these desperate farms was a location that was almost unique in its support of making moonshine whiskey. On the first line of my book, The Glen Rose Moonshine Raid, I wrote, if God had intended for men to make moonshine whiskey, he gave them Somerville County, Texas as a gift. <laughs> now before I go any further, I think it'd be a good idea to explain how moonshine whiskey is made and how that has an effect on the rest of the story. Now, a mash, a mash is created by soaking cracked corn, sugar, yeast, or maybe malted barley in a fresh, in fresh water in a barrel. The water is ideally from limestone streams that don't contain iron. Iron in the water ruins the taste of whiskey. The mash is allowed to ferment over a period of days Eventually, the yeast will break down the starches in the corn. The sugar sort of supercharges the process. Once the starch is broken down, it releases alcohol. Mash is then placed in a pot or a cooker, ideally made of copper and heated. Once it reaches around 180 degrees Fahrenheit, the alcohol is converted to a gas. A cap is placed on top of the cooker that captures this gas and directs it through the copper tubing and then to a secondary container, usually a small barrel, and known as a thump keg. It gets its name from the sound that the steam makes inside the container. This guy described as sort of a bump or thump. Many moonshiners don't use the second step, but those who do describe it as sort of an extra distillation that tends to increase the alcoholic content of the vapors. Now the gas or vapor is then forced from the thump keg through copper tubing and through a spiral apparatus that's called the worm. The worm is contained in a large barrel or box that has constant cool water running through it. This causes the vapors in the worm to drop in temperature and revert back to the liquid. This is just simple distillation. You probably did it in high school. Not making moonshine in high school. <laughs> Maybe high school chemistry. 
From there, the liquid is then captured into containers, usually glass fruit jars. It is then mixed with clear, clean water until the right ratio of alcohol to water is produced, what's known as proof. The result is colorless and is often called white lightning. Now, Somerville County was ideally suited. There was plenty of firewood, cedar to get a fire going quickly and hot, and oak to keep the fire going steady. There were numerous freshwater streams running through the limestone hills. The cedar breaks and crevices allowed for concealment. Finally, it was close to ready markets of thirsty drinkers in Dallas, Fort Worth, and Waco. Many of the local farmers had learned the skill of making whiskey from their forebears in Tennessee, Arkansas, and Kentucky. Fields that were no longer producing cotton could be used to grow corn and barley. I'd mentioned the cliche earlier about the perfect storm. Sorry, we had to use it again. It was a perfect storm. Now, adding to this perfect storm was the production of oil that was turning small towns in Central and West Texas into boom towns. Thousands of young men were seeking their fortunes, working as roughnecks in these boom towns. With pockets full of ample salaries, these men sought out roadhouses and juke joints to wash down the dust with a little corn whiskey and beer. Bootleggers began to ferry this illegal alcohol between stills and places like Glen Rose, to roadhouses and places like Desdemona, Ranger, Brackenridge, and Wichita Falls. Many were in it for quick profits. Others, I think, kind of like the thrill of racing along dark roads in their Model Ts with a load of moonshine trying to stay one step ahead of the law. One of these men was Dick Watson. In today's language, I think we would probably call Dick an adrenaline junkie. He was born James Aaron Watson in the Hood County community of Thorpe Spring in August of 1895. Aside from Dick, as he was called, his parents, Robert and Mary Watson, had two other children, a son, Charlie Brady Watson, and a daughter, Eula Mae Watson. It was apparent from old family photos of Dick that he was tall, straight, and movie star handsome. His sister, Eula Mae, said of Dick later that he liked to sing and he even wrote stories and songs. But Dick had a little bit of a wild side, and he also seemed to crave excitement. War had been raging in Europe since 1914. The armies of France, Britain, and Germany slugged it out in fields and trenches. Men were dying by the thousands. The U.S. had managed to stay out of the fight. The constant attacks on U.S. ships by German U-boats in the Atlantic finally brought the U.S. into the fray. Woodrow Wilson declared war on Germany in March of 1917 and put out a call for volunteers to come fight the Army of the Kaiser. What was expected to be an enlistment of a million young men, however, turned out to be a dismal 73,000. Soon the Conscription Act was passed and draft notices went out. Well, Dick Watson didn't wait for draft notice. The next month, in May of 1917, Dick voluntarily joined the 3rd Cavalry Regiment and was soon on his way to Europe. There his unit was absorbed by the 9th Infantry Regiment and he found himself in several pitched battles, one of which was a campaign in the Meuse Argonne. For their extreme bravery, the French awarded the 9th Infantry the Croix de Guerre. This was the highest award that the French, the French could give to an Allied army. When the war ended in November 1918, Dick volunteered to stay behind and serve in the Army of Occupation in Germany. He eventually came home and was assigned to Fort Travis in San Antonio to await being returned to civilian life. But after having survived pitched battles in Europe and the excitement of occupation in Germany, life at Fort Travis must have been boring to an adrenaline junkie like Dick. He eventually just walked away. The army called him a deserter. <laughs> Never mind the fact he just spent the last several years fighting battles for his country in Europe. The army called him a deserter. Dick found his way back to Brackenridge 
where he joined hundreds of other young men in the oil fields working on a pipeline crew. To avoid being arrested as a deserter, he took the name Joe Brady, using the middle name of his brother, Charlie Brady Watson. It wasn't long before Charlie joined him, using the name Charlie Brady. Together, the Brady brothers <laughs> labored in the oil fields for humble oil, even showing up in the 1920 U.S. Census under the name Brady. Well, by now, Somerville County Moonshine Enterprise was becoming a big business. A popular Glen Rose doctor saw the need to organize these various steels and mills around the county. He sought to coordinate production, set the price, and act as a go-between with bootleggers in Dallas and Fort Worth. He also saw to it that the local sheriff and the county prosecutor were getting their cut to look the other way. He made sure that local stores kept a constant supply of fruit jars and sugar, do necessary items that the Somerville County Fields could not produce. It became what was later described by a Texas Ranger as the largest liquor syndicate in the state of Texas. The money was pouring in. But an operation that big could not go unnoticed for long, and soon it became evident that someone was making a lot of moonshine whiskey in Glen Rose. Hood County Sheriff Bud Larn described neighboring Somerville as a damned eyesore and instructed his deputies to stop any vehicles coming out of Somerville and into Hood County at night. And nearby Cleburne, Johnson County Sheriff Andy Moreland was beginning to notice the excessively large amounts of sugar and large numbers of fruit jars that were being delivered by the Interurban Express train and picked up by transport drivers from Glen Road. But it's when a large copper steel was offloaded from the train <laughs> that it became apparent to the sheriff that somebody in Glen Road was making out a lot of hell in this well, He confiscated the steel which belonged to the owner of Glen Road's grocery store. Now, copper, for a variety of reasons, was a preferred material for the construction of steels, and moonshiners had to rely on shops in large cities like Dallas to supply these special items. Well, eventually all this began to reach the ears of Governor Pat Neff. <clears throat> Turning to his favorite means of enforcement, he sent Texas Ranger Captain Hardy Shemate to Somerville County to have a look around and report back to him. Well, Dick Watson was by now a familiar face at the several of the Somerville County steels. His bootlegging trips into the oil patch were becoming more frequent, and his boyish, straightforward manner was gaining him many friends among the moonshine. So much so that one steel owner offered Dick a half interest partnership. He was even trusted to carry a cash bribe to the county prosecutor, Eddie Rourke. <laughs> At one steel site, Watson reported that there were 120 barrels of mash waiting to be cooked. The huge steel consisted of two large wooden cookers with copper bottles. They were situated on either side of a running stream and water from the stream was flowing simultaneously through the two worm boxes. Watson figured that his bootlegging enterprise appeared to be solid for the foreseeable future. What he didn't foresee, however, was an encounter with a Hood County deputy sheriff. Now, having been instructed by Sheriff Lorne, Hood County deputies were closely watching the roads leading into their county from the adjacent summer. On March 11, 1923, Deputy E.G. Thorpe noticed the new Model T heading into Hood County from Somerville and decided to stop it and have a look. Well, it didn't take them long to find Watson's loaded moonshine whiskey. The whiskey and the new Model T were confiscated and Dick was lodged in the Hood County Jail. The Sheriff Lord liked Dick Watson. He had known him since Dick was five years old and was well acquainted with his family. He once described Dick as the most truthful man I have ever talked to. But Dick was in big trouble. He was already under indictment for transporting illegal liquor in one of the oil patch counties. He was destined to five years in the Texas penitentiary for violations of the Dean Act. For the young war hero who had so far lived a life of adrenaline pumping excitement, five years might just as well be a death sentence. Dick appealed to the sheriff for help, and the sheriff knew away. 
The Anti-Saloon League, as part of their prohibition efforts, would subsidize special prohibition agents to work alongside duly sworn law enforcement officers. Sheriff Lawrence reached out to E.L. McCauley of the Anti-Saloon League, asking that Watson be given the job of special agent. Watson asked that the law enforcement agency he's assigned to be the Texas Rangers. In short order, Captain R.D. Shoemate was summoned to the Hood County Jail, and Dick began working with him to eliminate the Glen Rose, Moonshine, and Cindy. Well, soon Watson returned to the steels in the hills. This time he was the eyes and ears of the Texas Rangers. He noted names and locations, helping the Rangers map out these locations. Watson asked his brother Charlie to take a brief vacation from the oil fields and accompany him as an independent witness. <laughs> Captain Shoemate brought in Ranger, Texas Ranger Marvin Burton to work with Watson. Burton was called Red, a nickname that became apparent when he took off his big Stetson hat. Burton was a former deputy sheriff in McClendon County and was known and respected by Governor Neff. And acting on Watson's information, Burton set about planning a coordinated raid that would take down the entire Somerville County liquor operation in one fell swoop. Captain R.D. Shoemate and Ranger Red Burton quietly went about amassing a small army of Texas Rangers and local law enforcement officers in the early morning hours of August 23rd, 25th, 1923. They were broken up into teams with a ranger heading each team. Spotters had been sent out the night before to watch the various steel locations that had been mapped out by Red Burton and Dick Watson. Just before daylight, they struck. The first to be arrested by the rangers was the Somerville County Sheriff. He was locked in his own jail, and the rangers used his office for their base of operations. Soon, truckloads of broken up steels bags of sugar, and jars full of illegal moonshine began to accumulate on the courthouse lawn. Curious town people stood in large groups in the town square, watching truck after truck stop, unload, and then head back out. The curiosity turned to shock when law enforcement officers began to arrive with carfuls of their friends, neighbors, and relatives, people that they went to church with people that they saw every day all being led into the courthouse, clearly in custody of the law officers with them. Eventually, the word got out and people came from all around to gawk at the spectacle that was unfolding in the town square of Dan Brothers. <clears throat> Working from a list of names and locations, the lawmen spent all that day and into the next, destroying steels, smashing up barrels of mash, and bringing in offenders. They only stopped briefly when ladies from the local church served the officers lemonade sandwiches. <laughs> Once the raid started, many of the moonshiners headed for the hills, literally. At the end of the first day, over 30 men had been arrested, too many for the small Somerville County lockup. That meant that some had to be lodged in the Cleveland jail. As the sun rose on the second day, some of those who had fled the law officers the day before began to come down out of the hills and surrender. Eventually, just under 50 men were loaded up in a caravan of cars and were taken to Waco to be arraigned before a federal judge. This included the Somerville County Sheriff and the County Prosecutor. But once the men were arraigned, they were placed in the McLean County Jail. But they weren't there long. The president of the First National Bank of Glenrose arranged for the bail and all were released. Governor Neff wasn't satisfied with seeing these men charged with violating the Volstead Act in federal court. He appointed a special prosecutor and instructed the Rangers to file the cases as violations of the Dean Act, which carried a much stiffer penalty, and were filed in state court, a mistake that would come back to haunt him later. Many of the offenders entered guilty pleas, most given a year in prison and a fine. Some, due to their advanced or young ages, were given suspended sentences. Some, however, chose to fight and hired batteries of lawyers to represent them. The trials started in September of 1923 in both Bosque and Johnson counties. Now, Johnson County was chosen 
since the Somerville County prosecutor was one of the defendants. And it was believed that an unbiased jury pool could not be found in Somerville County. A fact that would present itself later, by the way. Well, in the meantime, Ranger Red Burton and Dick Watson moved out to Navarro County and conducted the same type of operations in and around Corsa County. Smashing stills and bringing in moonshine. Watson was working so closely with the Rangers at that time that he was even referred to as a Ranger in the local news coverage. Burton remarked how much he admired the honesty and bravery of Dick Watson. Soon Watson was offered a job as an officer, probably a special prohibition officer, by the city of Corsicana. He divided his time between his enforcement duties there and in Cleveland testifying in the trials of the Glen Rose defendants. Despite putting up valiant defenses, the Glen Rose defendants began to fall to convictions in court. The Somerville County Sheriff even had six lawyers at his defense table. It didn't help him. They weren't able to stop the jury from sentencing the sheriff to four years in prison. Soon other defendants began to realize that the chances of getting acquittal looked pretty slim and decided to start changing their pleas to guilty. As the district court session for 1923 came to an end in November, the only defendant left untried was County Prosecutor Eddie Rourke, who was charged with accepting bribes. His trial was scheduled for the new session that would begin in January 1924. And when the new session began in January, District Judge Erwin T. Ward set February 20th as a date to begin trying Eddie Rourke for accepting bribes from Glen Rose Moonshiners. <clears throat> By now, the former county prosecutor had resigned and was working in a Granbury law firm. When court was gaveled into session by Judge Ward on the 20th, Rourke was defended by former Texas State Senator D.W. O'Dell. Dick Watson had been summoned from Corsicana to testify delivering a cash bribe to Rourke. Now, Lori O'Dell immediately attempted to have Watson disqualified as a witness due to the fact that he had deserted the Army back in 1919. That didn't work. When that attempt failed, Watson began his testimony. Seated in the courtroom were Texas Rangers from Corsicana and Waco who had been working with Dick Watson in Somerville and Navarro counties. Watson described the night that he passed a cash bribe to Rourke. He also testified to the fact that he was currently a detective of the Corsicana Police Department. At the end of the day, Watson had planned to return to a Cleveland hotel where he had been staying. Since both he and Ranger Red Burton had been receiving death threats, Burton decided to bring Watson back with him to Glen Rose so he could offer him some protection. Since the raids, Burton had been the main law enforcement officer in Somerville County. In the absence of their sheriff, who was by then in the penitentiary of Munster. Watson and Burton arrived at the boarding house that evening, just off the square in Glen Rose, where Burton had been staying. <coughs> Excuse me. The boarding house owner had agreed to fix the late dinner for Burton and Watson if Burton would later drive her to a church meeting. Watson asked to go along and be dropped off at the home of a friend who lived in a cottage next to Paluxy Creek. It was a cold night with freezing drizzle and Burton loaned Watson his overcoat, telling Dick to meet him back at the boarding house at 10 o'clock. Burton drove his rounds through the county and then parked his car in a local garage and started his walk back to the boarding house. He was aware that he had been followed throughout the evening. As he walked past the house on the way, he was called over to the porch by a man who had been sitting there. The man was a local doctor and a friend of Burton's and quietly told Burton that he was being followed. Burton told him that he knew and he also knew who it was. As they briefly talked, the quiet of the evening was shattered by a shotgun blast from the direction of Paluxy Creek. Now Burton knew right away that it came from the house where he had earlier dropped Dick Watson off and rushed over with the doctor right behind him. There they found that Watson had been shot to death. Watson's friend told Burton that he and his family had been visiting with Watson all evening, and as Watson was standing up to put on the overcoat that Burton had given, he was struck with buckshot that was fired from the window across the room. Seething with anger, Burton rushed to the courthouse 
and to the office of sheriff where he telephoned for additional rangers and area law officers to come to Glen Rose and to help him hunt for the assassins of Dick Watson. Burton found tracks to indicate that the shooters had arrived by driving along the muddy creek of the Paluxy and then walking up to the cottage. Tracks in the mud outside the cottage indicated that there were two shooters. As other officers arrived, suspicion began to fall on two sets of brothers and the town doctor who had organized the moonshiners two years earlier. Once arrested, the suspects were separated and lodged in different jails, including Dallas and Fort Worth. Attorneys appeared at these jails with writs to release the suspects, only to find that they had been moved and were one step ahead of the release papers. All the while, the officers were attempting to get the suspects to confess. When I was a young detective, we called that the East Texas Railroad. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do that anymore. While this game of tag was being played out, Dick Watson was being eulogized through the state. One came from the adjutant general of the state of Texas who commanded the Rangers, citing Watson for his bravery and service to the Texas Rangers in the state of Texas. Public praise also came from the prosecutors in Cleveland. In a public statement, these prosecutors said of Dick, there was not in all of Texas a man who was more honestly earnestly and fearlessly fighting to eliminate moonshine whiskey from the terrorists which attended. Now in the meantime, Red Burton got a curious visitor. An ex-con with a long criminal record turned himself into Burton, telling him that he had been contacted by prominent Glen Rose businessmen, one of which was the president of the First National Bank, and was offered $2,500 to kill both Burton and Watson. Knowing that killing the Texas Ranger would get him a swift trip to the newly installed electric chair in Huntsville, the ex con decided he wasn't going to do it. When he heard of the shooting, he decided he'd better come forward and tell what he knew in case he was connected later with the shooting. Burton believed that had the doctor not stopped him that night, he too might have been ambushed and killed. The ex con also told Burton if he planned on indicting the suspects in Somerville County, he wasn't going to be successful. Ex-con was told that the majority of the grand jurors were moonshiners themselves. Well, when confessions were not forthcoming from the men who had been arrested by Burton, and when the writs of habeas corpus finally caught up with them, they were all released from custody. Burton did try to obtain the indictments and found what the ex-con had told him was true. He was defeated by nine out of 12 votes. Burton then waited for a new grand jury to be impaneled and tried again, only to be voted down again. He even went before the federal judge in Waco, who had arraigned the men back in 1923, saying that the suspects had killed a federal witness. But the judge reminded him of when Governor Neff ordered the cases filed under the Texas Dean Act and not the Federal Volstead Act, that Dick Watson was no longer under their juris or under federal jurisdiction. <coughs> From my examination of Red Burton's personal notes in the Texas Ranger Hall of Fame, I believe he was certain in his mind who killed Dick Watson that time. He was just un unable to come up with any solid proof. No one was ever tried or convicted for the murder of Dick Watson. In 1924, Governor Neff decided against running for a third term. Winning the election was Miriam Ferguson, who was known as Maul. Now, Ma had different views about prohibition from those who lived. She and her husband, former Governor James E. Ferguson, who was known as Paul, didn't support prohibition. Among the first things Ma did when she got into office was to pardon many of the men serving time in the Texas Penitentiary for liquor violations. <coughs> this number included all those still in prison <coughs> as a result of the Glen Rose Raid. With a few strokes of Maul's pen, the story of the Glen Rose Moonshine Raid of 1923 came to an end. My, uh, my father was a deputy sheriff in Dallas. He came there when he uh, returned home from World War II. And I virtually grew up in that old courthouse in jail. The sheriff then was named Bill Decker, and he was like my uncle. In fact, he was even the godfather of my first daughter. As I grew up, I heard story after story from those old deputies. 
One was a good friend of our family's named Ted Hinton. Ted was among the deputies in Texas Rangers who killed Clyde Bear and Bonnie Parker in Gibson, Louisiana in 1934. Well, of course, I was always fascinated with the stories of Ted and the little deputies who were killing I went to college to study journalism with the intent of becoming a writer or a newspaper reporter. Dropped out of college and went to the Army. I came home in 1968. I decided that I would take a job as a police officer until I could get back to college and complete my journalism degree. That I turned into about 15 years. <laughs> right away, I was promoted to detective, the position I kept most of the time I served. For a while, I was part of an organized crime strike force up in Dallas, and I found it interesting that some of the people we were pursuing were remnants of old gangs that had their origins in illegal liquor and gambling in Dallas. I always thought that history would make an interesting book. About 15 years ago, like a lot of old people, I decided to find a quiet place in the country and move out of Dallas and down Glen Rose. Once there, I started hearing all the local war, particularly about a little crossroads area down the highway from my place called Eulogy, near the Brazos River. Locals told me that during Prohibition, Eulogy was a rocking place, with roadhouses, dance halls, and brothels. Local moonshiners were said to hang around the roadhouses. <clears throat> Killings were not infrequent. The story goes that the Texas Rangers raided the area in the 1920s and eulogy pretty much dried up. Well, again, I thought this would make a good book. I'd written some articles for some uh, law enforcement magazines over the years, but I really wanted to write a book. And I figured eulogy would either make a good historical book or maybe the backdrop for a good period novel. So I started researching all these old stories I was hearing. The first place I headed was the Somerville County Heritage Center in the town square in Glen Rose. In fact, right across the street were nearly 100 years before steels were stacked on the courthouse lawn. The historian there was very friendly, and when I told her I was interested in the history of eulogy, she started to pull books off the shelves and stack them on the table in front of me. As I started flipping through these books, I casually told her I was interested in the old moonshiners there in the raid by the Texas Rangers in the 1920s. Suddenly, I felt like the temperature in the room dropped several degrees. <laughs> All of a sudden, she wasn't quite so friendly. She told me that others had tried to write about those incidents and found that local people wouldn't talk to her. In short, she discouraged me from doing any further research on the subject of writing anything related to those incidents in the 1920s. I knew my time was up, but she began picking up the books off the table and putting them back on the shelf. <laughs> well, one thing I knew from years of being a detective and private investigator was how to find facts. So I started digging. Well, it didn't take me long to find the story that I just told you earlier. And I understood why the historian was cautious about anyone telling this story. Many of the people involved still had families, even businesses there in Somerville County. But right away, I found that there was no death certificate filed for Dick Watson when he was killed in 1924. In fact, the one that exists in county records today was filed some 14 years later by his former wife, Lena. She was probably trying to get benefits from their son for Dick's service in World War I. Then when I found that Watson had been a law officer when he was killed, I decided that his death should not go unnoticed. With the help of a former police officer friend of mine that worked in Austin for CLEAT, it's a combined law enforcement officer association, we had James Aaron Dick Watson listed as a fallen officer in the officer down memorial page that's online. You look him up. During my research, I had located Dick's granddaughter, and had reached out to her. When I told her, I called her and told her that her grandfather was listed as a fallen officer. She was extremely grateful and had not really known many of the facts surrounding his death. I promised her that one day I'd write a book about Dick and the incidents in 1923. I finally fulfilled that promise I made to her and myself, really, when the Glen Rose Moonshine Raid was published by Arcadia Publishing in 2017. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank Maurice Walton, Roger, if he was here, for inviting me to come and speak tonight. I'll be sure to entertain any questions.
Not the question to be in a can, of course, but I don't have time to just sing. Oh, I can sing you out there. Oh, my goodness, there's a lot of people. No questions? No confessions? You know, I've, I've started about four different outlines, and uh, these things take a lot of work. You know, if you're going to write it correctly, when I, when I wrote this one, I knew that I was going to get a lot of blowback from a lot of people. So I made sure that every sentence I wrote was like chiseling footsteps in stone. I knew that I had something to stand on for everything I wrote. And boy, that took, that took about five years of research and libraries and courthouses. So uh, yeah, I've got some ideas. It's nothing that seems to jail right at the moment. But appreciate the question. Isn't it? Nobody was ever convicted. They're in my book, yeah. Yeah, there were several of them. Oh, they the tried question. to kind of a horn. Yes. Repeat the question, please. I was wanting to know if the names of the people that uh, Burton suspected for killing Dick Watson were in my book, and I told her they were. They, uh, I had talked to uh, relatives of those people. In fact, the grandson of one of them, uh, I spoke with him. He was. He said that they grew up not knowing anything. They heard stuff, but they just didn't know. And they were all grateful that I had written the book. I, I, you know, I figured that I, I'd always heard as I was writing it and researching it that I was going to get a lot of, you know, a lot of flack from people for writing it. And, and, the, and the lady that cautioned me actually turned out to be very helpful. Actually, she supplied some of the pictures that I had in my book. I knew a lot of did you really? Yeah. Oh, I bet. And, and, and you know, they've still got families there and uh, very, very prosperous folks and very good people. Read my book. Yes, sir. My name is Jesse Crook. <laughs> well, there might be a relative that is. <laughs> that was one of the saddest parts of my book. Was a doctor for I said that old man for a simple old man for And uh, anyway, he didn't live very much longer when he, when he got out. I was what, four years, four, five years, five years in advance. And I they just broke, they just broke me like something silly. To this. I'm sorry, I, didn't, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to get up and get my opinion. But that, that was one of the saddest things in the book. Pardon me? My grandfather Oh, really? I met one of them. Was it you I met? Or that, was my that was your brother I met, yeah, over at the at the highway, uh, over there at the breakfast in the morning. Thank you. Uh, Roger brought him over. There's a lot more stories than you did again. <laughs> oh, and I have heard a bunch of them since. Well, maybe I'm going to do a secret. You know what I'm but, uh, you know, those people just fought me. They just fought me. Somebody was telling me that, of course, back in the old days, in those days, of, the old Model T's had wooden spokes in the wheels. And then as the Rangers were up the hill raiding the steels, the kids were sawing the <laughs> wooden spokes from the wheels of the Rangers. So, it, uh, I don't blame you. Anyway, folks, thank you so much. I appreciate you not swarming out loud.